Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's office hours. I'm Jennifer Splansky Jester, Executive Director at the Collective Impact Forum, and we are delighted to have you here with us today. Thanks so much for joining. Before we go any further, I want to acknowledge the land that we're on. This session is being uh, pre presented and recorded on the traditional land of the Ohlone, Coast Salish, Suquamish, and the Duwamish people, past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Ohlone, Coast Salish, Suquamish, and Duwamish tribes. Thank you. We also want to invite you all to check in, say hello in the chat. And as you do that, please let us know the indigenous lands that you are on. If that's not something that you are familiar with, there are actually two resources here if you're based in the United States or Canada that can help you obtain that information. So native-land.ca or there's a text service here with the number on the screen. Uh, this is an awesome service that is brought to you by Code for Anchorage. So go ahead and put your uh, hello and indigenous lands in the chat. I'll just give a second for folks to do that. Thanks everyone. So fun to, to see us all coming in. So you can go ahead and keep doing that as I just do a few logistical announcements before we get into the content of today's session. So this is what we call one of our office hour sessions. They're made to be uh, primarily focused on Q&A and giving some thought partnership to the work that you're doing. So we, you know, when I say we, I'm talking about myself and my colleague, Junius Williams, who is joining me today. You know, we're here to, to field questions. I will largely be doing the moderation. And we come bringing our lived and learned experience, not claiming to have all the answers, but look forward to sharing with you. We also welcome you to share answers to each other's questions in the chat. We had one of these office hours last week and just got so much good information and insight and experience in the chat also, in addition to from our presenters. And so very much welcome you to engage using the chat with each other. So if you are gonna be sharing questions though, please do put those in the Q&A box. This is a Zoom webinar, which means there's a chat box and a Q&A box. Just putting it in the Q&A makes it easier for us to find amidst the very lively chat that, that will come in. A couple other points, uh, a recording of today's session will be made available in the next day or so, and we'll send you an email. You can feel free to share it with others in your network as well. And um, if you wanna share on social media, the handle is here and we welcome and encourage you to do so. Finally, we have live captioning turned on. So if you are finding it helpful, that's great. If you are finding it distracting and would like to turn it off, there is a uh, ability to do that using the live transcript uh, button on your toolbar in the Zoom platform. So that is up to you whether you wanna turn that on or off. So with that, I wanna formally introduce my colleague Junius Williams who is joining us today. Junius is a senior advisor here at the Collective Impact Forum. He also um, runs his own consulting group, Junius Williams Inc. And he's the former CEO of Urban Strategies Council, amongst many other contributions to the social sector. So with that, I want to welcome you, Junius. And Junius is gonna just share a few framing slides and remarks before we dive into questions. All right, Junius. Thank you, uh, Jen, appreciate it. And also uh, thank uh, uh, Tracy from the CIF staff who's working uh, vigorously behind the scenes to make everything work. Uh, and thank all of you for uh, attending today. What I wanna do is to just, just take a, a couple minutes to uh, offer a couple of framing slides as Jen uh, indicated. And these come out of uh, my work over the last uh, year or so with various uh, folks around the country and is reflecting the kind of questions and discussions that we've had. I call it, although it's probably an inappropriate name, kind of situating your equity work. And uh, the reason for that will become um, apparent as I walk through the slides, but um, 
the enormity of trying on top of everything that you're already doing in terms of your focus uh, on a, a significant social problem, you're building the infrastructure uh, for your collaboration, there is kind of this 800 pound object in the middle of everything uh, related to equity. And so these two tools, I want to walk through really quickly, uh, just as a backdrop. And if you have questions specifically on those, we can address them. Uh, the first is the slide is this one. And this is around understanding that implementing action uh, to, to address equity, to try to reduce or eliminate disparities that one discovers uh, in terms of outcomes uh, for folks. Um, can take a lot of different forms. And this is just my attempt to kind of organize and align uh, uh, these. And essentially, I want to start at the bottom uh, with the equity lens. One of the first things that folks have to do is adopt uh, an equity lens uh, as a way to examine and understand what's happening in your local uh, context as it relates to people who are experiencing uh, inequitable outcomes. So an equity lens is a way to understand the data, the context, and the entirety uh, of the work. And it's a good starting point because you need to understand the landscape that you're gonna attempt to navigate through in order to achieve a higher level of equity. One thing that a lot of organizations and collaboratives uh, do as a second kind of form of action uh, is adopting some sort of principle or value statement or around commitment to equity, which can guide their work and operate as a standard against which to uh, assess their work. And also when you get to many of the tough decisions uh, principles and value statement give you one additional frame through which to uh, consider your decision making. Strategies and interventions are another form of action. You're working in your collaborative to try to attack some problem and you've probably generated a series of strategies and interventions that you think if successfully emanate uh, implemented will reduce or eliminate uh, uh, the disparities and the underlying causes uh, of the disparities. So strategies and interventions can be uh, a form of action uh, for implementation around equity. Uh, policy is also a form of action and a focal point uh, in terms of requiring equity as a foundation for all of your policy development processes, but that also should be manifested in the language of the policies and the procedures and the practices that are adopted uh, uh, to uh, uh, affect the focal problem. Um, at even a higher level is the notion of establishing equity as an explicit outcome for the work that you're doing and having a robust set of indicators and targets to measure the progress uh, around your equity uh, goals and objectives. And finally, sort of the premier form of action is when an organization adopts equity as a North Star and basically says to itself as an organization and to the community in which it's organized, that equity is a part of every single thing we do. It's the North Star of the work. That's obviously a uh, pretty rarefied air because few organizations have gotten to the point where they're able to convince and their entire stakeholder group that that's uh, essential to whatever else the work that they uh, are attempting to accomplish, that equity is the North Star of that work. So this again is just some forms of, of different types of implementation action when people are trying to embed equity. What is it that you do? Well, you work from an equity lens, you establish principles and values, you focus in your strategies and interventions, you adopt policies that say you're about equity and how you effectuate equity. It's part of your outcome statements and your measures. And for some organizations, it's a North Star. 
So that's the forms of action. What makes it even more difficult is reflected in the next slide, which is about the fact that there are at least four levels of activity going on and you need to not only decide what form of uh, equity implementation action you're taking, but at what level in this infrastructure you've developed uh, uh, for your uh, collective impact collaborative work. And the options among others are to focus on the strategies and interventions, what it is that you're doing about the problem and to ensure that the way that you're doing that is immersed in equity principles and practices. So while you're working on the longer term things that I'll get to in a moment, at least people see the fact that the things that we're going to do about the problem explicitly um, uh, demonstrate our commitment to equity. The second level, though, is that you've built a collaborative uh, structure of some sort with steering committees or work groups and that whole infrastructure. To what extent is that demonstrating uh, that you're practicing uh, equity? So that's a second level that you could say, well, we need to get all on the same page and the collaborative needs to have a commitment to equity and needs to be doing things around making sure that you effectuate equity. But there's also a backbone and uh, a, a backbone organization or organizations and how are they around their practices of equity? Uh, that's especially important, number two and three. The collaborative infrastructure and the backbone is something that you've recently developed. Unfortunately, in a lot of situations, people haven't paid attention to equity. So there's some repair work that you need to go back and do around the way that you compose your backbone and your collective impact collaborative infrastructure. The final uh, level is partner organizations. These collaboratives are composed of partner organizations. And at some point, you need to address the fact that all of these organizations need to develop their own commitments around equity and that there are things that need to be going on within their own uh, organizations that send these various actors to the table around making sure that they're doing their best work uh, uh, around equity. Are they doing a, an organizational equity assessment? Are they figuring out are they figuring out what their principle and value statements are? All the things that we talk about should be happening in those organizations. It's very hard for this new collaborative infrastructure to practice a, and um, and project equity if all of the base organizations are not moving in that same direction. So again, I'll just conclude before we throw it open to questions by saying this adds to the enormity and the complexity of the equity task on top of you know, the traditional metaphor of flying the plane while building it. All of a sudden, you've got to figure out how to do equity at multiple levels, potentially. Final comment, you can't do all of this at one time. And part of my notion about situating equity, you need to figure out what your priorities are and do a good job on some aspect of it rather than dabbling in all of these areas and not making any progress on any of them. So with that, uh, I'll conclude my opening remarks and throw it back to Jen. Thank you, Junius. I Every time I see those two frameworks, I find them so helpful. A little overwhelming, as you said, but also very helpful in terms of giving folks ideas about, about where to start, like you said. So we got a couple questions before today's webinar, um, and please, uh, of course, add more questions now. But I want to start with one that we got that is... Um, about how to define or explain equity to folks. So the question was asked, equity can mean multiple things. Is there an approach or explanation that takes that into account? What do you think about that, Junius? Uh, yeah, one of the early things when you decide that you want to focus on uh, equity that 
uh, we strongly recommend is that you need a, a shared language to have the conversation and obviously uh, having a conversation where you're collectively coming up with a definition of equity that is suitable for your local context and work. Uh, and that that should be a process that is not only coming up with a definition, but getting people comfortable with talking uh, about the underlying issues related to equity and whether it's racial equity or gender equity or it's economic equity, whatever sort of uh, focal point th that you have, it's important to engage people. I also quickly say is that there are a lot of examples out there. So this isn't like out of the whole cloth. Um, one of the things that um, I am doing on um, with a group I'm working with now is I've asked them all to go back as homework to their organizations and find out if you got a definition and let's bring all of the definitions together to see what the local culture has developed around definitions. And then we can augment that with many of the organizations out there uh, from foundations to governmental entities also have it. So you don't have to start from ground zero and there's some tools out there, but you're right in your assumption that there are a lot of definitions, you know, uh, just as an anecdote. S sometimes when you say equity, if you haven't said social equity, immediately people go to ownership interest in a business. I mean, that's uh, has been traditionally the predominant definition of equity. So you're right, you need to figure out how to get started and how to have not only for equity, but a, a common language uh, that people have agreed to and understand in order to have effective uh, communication and conversation. Thank you, Junius. Um... I'm just reading through some of the questions coming in. So I want to refer back to the levels of equity framework, the concentric circles. Mm -hmm. And um, Deb asks, you know, would you recommend that it's sequential, like start with the strategies, then it's the collaborative or actually, so this is the second framework you shared. Uh, so the start with the strategies, then the collaborative or start where there's readiness. Like, how do you think about sequencing? On that second on that second frame you shared uh on the second uh, mm -hmm. on the levels uh no where i say is start with interventions because you're in this collaborative space and that you are trying to establish relationships across stakeholder groups across the community one of the first things they're going to see is your pronouncement of this is what we're going to do about the problem and I think it's really critically important that people see your vision about equity when you come out of the box. So I recommend, and it's why it's number one on the chart. I think that's the most important thing because uh, it's your, unfortunately for a lot of collaboratives, it's the first visible thing that people know, especially people in, um, the beneficiary group, because we haven't done as good a job as we should around their inclusion in our uh, assessment planning process. It's really critical that if you can get it right there, that people know that you're committed uh, to equity and not only in your language, but in your actual practices, and they see that manifested uh, in the interventions that you start and strategies that you start deploying, that's going to help to develop a sense of trust and confidence among people that you are about doing things differently. So that would be my suggestion is start there. And as I said before, hopefully you've gotten some of this right early on in the composition of your collaborative and backbone. But if you haven't, that's where I'd go to next that we not only are pronouncing it and we are living it because we're changing the way that we operate our backbone and collaborative to make sure that equity uh, uh, is, is a focus of that work. Great, thank you, Junius. And I brought this back up because we had a few requests for that. So um, this, is, this is the frame that Junius was speaking to. 
Uh, so a couple of questions coming in that are related. So equity often means ensuring that the people most affected are driving the solutions. Um, what does resident engagement uh, and participation look like and how does that fit in this frame? And then a related question um, that we got before the webinar is, are steering committees a respectful use of time for people with lived experience? So some commentary on the role of folks with lived experience, when and how to engage role on the steering committee. Okay, uh, let me let me answer the second question first, uh, which is about whether or not it's a respectful uh, use of, of uh, time to have uh, people with lived experience on the steering committee. Absolutely, I don't. The re, what's causing me pause is respectful, um, but. I think it's essential to have people with lived experience um, at, on every decision-making body and work group that you have, because bringing that lived experience together with the learned uh, experience is essential to get things right. Uh, it's also essential that people who are intended beneficiaries or the lived uh, experience feel like they own what it is that's going on in the process. Because I often say to folks, long after all of us are gone and what was the collective impact initiative is gone, whether or not the strategies and interventions sustain is whether or not people who were the intended beneficiaries, people in the community, people with lived experience, think they were worthwhile and need to continue. And so it's absolutely essential. Let me make one other point though, is it would be even more respectful of their presence if you constructed that table so they're like everybody else. One of the problems that we create in these because we don't think them through and we don't think about them from an equity perspective is why is it that the only people who ain't getting paid at the table are the people with lived experience? That's an issue of, of equity. Everybody else around that table is usually, you can have one meeting or a hundred, I don't care, and I'm, I'm sorry for saying it, but I'm gonna get paid, so I'm gonna be here doing my job, and then we have a group of people who are probably the most essential to be there, and they don't get anything, it has, all of what we collectively have created that has injured them, we're now saying you need to come to the table and fix that while all of us are getting paid and you ain't. There's an inequity to that that is frightening. So yes, they need to be at the table and we need to figure out a way to pay them. In some of the projects I'm doing right now, we've been able to convince people to hire the residents as consultants. The same way they hire me as a consultant because I bring up expertise, hire them as consultants. So everybody around that table at least has that sort of equal uh, kind of footing or rec recognition really and respect that what you bring to the table is valuable and people who bring valuable things to the table get paid. So that's the first part of it. The, the second part uh, of the question is really a corollary to that is that when we compose these tables, we need to be thinking about who are all of the stakeholder groups and how do we engage and involve them. And maybe not all of them need to be at every leadership table, but certainly people who are the intended beneficiaries slash uh, people with lived experience absolutely have to be there. And our formula for creating the composition of those tables need to be mindful of the equity involved there. Let me go a step further. Creating a table that looks just like the table of those who've presided over all of our failures as society ain't going to produce any different result. And we need to understand that. And we have 
School districts as a classic example for two or three generations. We changed nothing about who was making decisions and we continued to get failure and bad results for our kids. And it was only when we started thinking more proactively about site-based decision-making, about full service community schools, about other sort of structural things that change the dynamic that we started seeing some different sort of re results for kids. So it's absolutely essential to have that analysis. I strongly recommend that people look at the collective impact um, uh, forums uh, toolkit on community engagement. There are a couple of assessment tools there that are fascinating to use to think about who is at the table and who is not there. But you need to get that right. And if you didn't get it right initially, just cop the plea on it. We miss this. Sorry, folks. Let's have a discussion about how we reconstitute this table so that it really reflects the values and principles that we want to drive and guide the work. And that means that key stakeholder groups and certainly intended beneficiaries and people with lived experience, people who live in the community, that's part of the geographic target of the work, they need to be represented. Let me make one other point. This ain't token representation. Bringing one person in, whether it's a young person or a person of color or whatever the characteristic of that subpopulation is, is almost a formula for failure. Nobody can speak for all people of that group. Nobody should be asked to do that. So you need to be thinking about what's the critical mass of people from those groups. They're going to give those people a sense that you're committed and give them a sense that they might have some colleagues and collaborators. Not that other folks at the table ain't, but there's sort of a natural alliance when I see another black person at a table. And if I see three or four, it gives me a message that whoever is constructing this they, they've got a sense about this issue and they're not bringing me out in isolation. They're bringing me in with a cohort of people and they're concerned my, about my sense of belonging and comfort there. Thank you, Junius. Lots of um, thank yous coming through the chat. Very appreciative of that. Um, Junius, a, a question here. How do you evaluate equity practices on an ongoing basis to ensure that they're serving the intended purpose? Whoa, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, that's a tough one because a lot uh, of focus needs to be, uh, before you, as a precursor to the evaluation, and I know that for you evaluators, please uh, excuse me, but a pre precursor to getting into that evaluation of kind of the outcomes part of whatever uh, strategies or, uh, or interventions you're employing uh, is figuring out the extent to which it's been adequately implemented. And that's a real problem with equity. From years ago when I did school desegregation work, we discovered a phenomenon on all of this stuff that is called implementer's revenge. No matter how well you design it, uh, no, how, how forward thinking it is, it ultimately comes down and it's put in the hands typically of mid-level bureaucrats and they spell the effectiveness of implementation. And there's a lot of resistance and struggle. It's very hard when the top down says you're gonna do something and you haven't convinced the, the middle and lower tiers of that organization. So you get implementers revenge. Okay, I'm gonna, I won't use uh, the bad term, but I'm gonna screw it up because I ain't gonna do this right. So figuring out the fidelity in the implementation is really critical before getting to uh, the evaluation point. So monitoring implementation and making sure that the things that you wanted to have in place have been given a fair chance in terms of the quality of the implementation is a starting point. The other point I would make is differentiation uh, by virtue of the type of, of action uh, that that's being taken. Some types of equity implementation, for example, if you're talking about specific programmatic uh, 
uh, um, programmatic implementation, uh, closing or reducing disparities is for me a big one because if I see those disparities reducing and shrinking, and I don't know all the causal attribution and stuff, but I know something's going on that is causing that and I wanna maximize that. So I'm always gonna be looking at whether or not those, are, uh, those uh, disparities are reducing. I'm also gonna be looking at some things that are kind of yes or no. To what extent do we have policies that are now commanding that we do things uh, differently and how are they being implemented? Um, you know, uh, on the, the, the outcome level, as I've said before, making sure that we've gotten the measures. I don't mean to be dancing around it, but it is so particular to what form of action that you're taking. Uh, but it is possible um, to, to craft some tools. Uh, Jen just reminded me yesterday when we were in a, a meeting uh, around the systems uh, evaluation tool, uh, the Opportunity Youth Forum uh, uh, created, and uh, maybe Tracy can put that in the chat for people. But that's a good tool to think about uh, how you capture data, uh, and it's from a systems frame, but I think a lot of those same principles that are in that piece would apply to equity. Uh, the other thing that, that I want to say, though, is that there's also a perceptual issue here that I don't want to undervalue. Asking people who are part of the affected groups whether they feel things are changing is a really important threshold piece of data around the effectiveness. Uh, because if they're, they are at the table, they know what you're trying to do, and if their attitudes are changing, around their level of confidence around the commitment and the movement on equity, that that's probably a good early indicator that you may be on the right track because the people who know the issue and have uh, experienced some of the adverse impacts of not successfully uh, dealing with equity are saying and feeling better about what's going on then I would want to know that as a really valuable piece of data that might early tell me that maybe I'm feeling okay from my vantage point, but the people who are impacted by it ain't, and that should send off some warning signals. Thank you, Junius. And I just linked to uh, the an evaluation report from the Aspen Forum for Community Solutions that includes their framework for measurement. And this also, I think, gets to the question, Mar I think it was Marsha you were asking in the chat around, um, you know, work is very long term, especially when we're talking about measuring equity. How do you know when you're making a difference? So it takes so long to, since it takes so long to ac accomplish population change. Uh, Junius, I think you were speaking to this a bit and where my mind was going was, not only measuring population change, of course, yes, and progress toward it, but also shifts in the systems that you're trying to move that to make those systems more equitable. So the policies, how resources are flowing, are you shifting power in the ways that Junius was talking about before? Those types of measures. And a lot of that um, leads you to some more qualitative measurement as well. So focus groups, surveys, um, interviews, stories, as really important data points for understanding some of the shifts in systems. Uh, let's see, I was so busy listening to you, Junius, that I need to check the questions coming in. So let's see, what is the recommended method for asking or surveying people in the affected population? Do you have insights on that, Junius? Um, yeah, it's, it's sort of uh, like the, um, current conversations going on around vaccine resistance uh, in terms of the strategy that's being employed by the public health field uh, all over the world. Who are the trusted folks? Uh, I You shouldn't probably try to go in yourself. You should go to folks with uh, deep history and trust and relationships in the community and ask them when you wanna know something about the community, how do you get the information? Would you help us get it? 
and to uh well, first of all, you already, they should probably already be at the table if they are specific to the community and all of that, but I won't go to that. But certainly getting people who have experience in outreach and engagement um, and some trust on the part of the community to figure out what the best methodology is to get, uh, you know, information uh, uh, from the population and what would they suggest as a methodology for you to build some relationships with that community directly to the collaborative so they're not always third party so that you've got a dual objective. Yeah, we want to get this survey filled in and stuff, but we want to do it in a way where we're building relationships with folks in that community so that they know, aside from you as our intermediary, that we are committed and value their opinion and uh, would value relationships that would permit us to work with them. Great, thank you. Um, okay, here we go. So someone is um, here from uh, the rural state of Vermont where they say that the population that, um, the population that hasn't been served equitably are people in multi-generational poor families often. They often exhibit a, it's always been this way, this is how my parents lived, how I lived, how my kids will live attitude. How do we engage with rural folk who are often not just remote geographically, but also remote from many of the likely partners in the CI effort? Uh, well, let me start with, a, with an admission. I've not worked a lot in uh, rural uh, areas, so I've got limited knowledge. Most of that has come up when I've worked in like regional efforts that include, that have a lot of urban uh, kind of uh, concentration, but then have some rural uh, areas on the out, uh, skirts of, of the region or uh, the region or, or the county. Um, what I, When I don't know where I always start is with humility that I don't understand this and how can I get into conversations with people from that community to get their uh, analysis and guidance and not try to jump in it and apply to recognize that I don't know and that I need to learn and to bring that curiosity to conversations with people who would then hopefully help me learn that. Um, but what I think is important in, in terms of getting that, because a rural community is no different than any other in the sense of the process that if you are really interrogating the data through an equity lens and you ask yourselves, who are, what are population characteristics in our community? And you, people say, well, we're rural and urban, we're uh, black, white, and Latinx, we are this and that. As you get those points of description about who your community is composed of, you begin to run the data analysis against those things that people recognize as population, subpopulation uh, characteristics, and you get some data. And when you get that data and you say, oh my goodness, rural folks seem to be having a disproportionately bad outcome on something, the same way I would do if it were males, if it were uh, black or brown boys, if it was any other subpopulation, once I recognize that they're experiencing disproportionately bad outcomes and I get that in the data, the first thing I'm going to do is try to establish relationships with folks from that community and ask them, teach me uh, and help me figure out how we better serve your community and to rely on that lived experience and expertise to guide what we decide to do. Long way of saying, I don't know, I need to ask. Thank you, Junius. Um, and some appreciation for sort of own, humbly owning where your expertise is and uh, approaching it from that place of inquiry coming through in the chat, yep. So a question um, that has come in is, how do you think about building the bench of practitioners working in DEI alongside 
you know, with the organizations and collaboratives, um, especially perhaps amongst predominantly white regions or, in, and again, a, a rural area example was asked, training, certification, community of practice, like what, what are you some go-to learning spaces that you think about Genius? There are a couple things that, and I may be off what the the um, the question is asking, and if so, redirect me back. But what struck me is initially, how do you develop bench strength? How do you develop a broad cadre of people who understand and are capable of leading and or supporting uh, equity work? And for me, that has a lot to do with the uh, incentive structure around all of this. And I often analogize that to community policing. One of the reasons we couldn't really move community policing is that internally to police department, it wasn't valued, rewarded, or incentivized. You could be you know everybody in a neighborhood and be on first uh, name basis, and it didn't help you in advancing in police departments that were supposedly all about community policing. You were still uh, valued and evaluated and rewarded in that system uh, based on other factors. And that's part of the reason that it never took is that if I'm career minded and want to move up the ranks, there's no value to doing that. I analogize that to equity work and DEI work because it needs to be incentivized, valued, and rewarded. When you can't move up within an organization, if you don't have an exemplary record around equity, all of us are, mo or most of us are motivated by those sort of extrinsic reward things. And therefore, if I know that's the path to advancement, I'm gonna develop skills. We do that all the time around all sorts of, of issues. Business needs to do it by equ around equity. Quick story. Uh, several years ago, I went to Jesse Jackson's Rainbow Push Technology Summit that he does every year. And I went to uh, um, a, a workshop that was conducted by seven big high tech firms. These are the big women boys in the game. Uh, in terms of DEI, and after these rather pedestrian presentations, that's my editorial comment, I wasn't Im impressed. Um, but anyway, at the end, I asked them, okay, I understand what you're doing. How many of you attach evaluation and compensation to performance around DEI? And not one of the seven did. And my reaction to them, and I said it publicly to them, I'll say it again, you ain't serious about this. You're tech, not tech people. You're data driven around everything. You reward around that structure. The fact that you ain't rewarding around it says you ain't serious about it. So that's a long way of saying you build one way of building strength that you could get to all the altruistic sort of morally right thinking people. Again, my editorial judgment. I think if you're positive about equity, you're moral and right thinking. That's my judgment. But part of what you do is you create an incentive structure where a lot of people gather and gain uh, uh, those skills because they see it as essential to their uh, m upward mobility uh, in terms of their profession. So that's a way that I think it needs to, to, to be dealt with. One other word is that I think people who are doing that work, uh, and especially white folks who are out there, they need support groups, boy. This stuff can get lonely out here barking about equity when you're in an environment, a culture, and a peer group where people are asking, what the hell are you thinking about? So the other thing that I would say is part of it is people need to have some support on this. This stuff is tough to do. And if you do it right, as we suggest, there is an individual introspective part of this about who am I and what do I believe in and what are my narratives and racist notions and all of that, which can be really disorienting for people and you need support. And then when you get into the work and you're trying to figure out, should I do this or that, or should I say something? 
having a network of support people who are encouraging you. Yeah, it may be painful, but you really need to do that. You need to stop them from telling those racist ass jokes in front of them. It's not enough for you to sit in the room and not say anything. You need to do that. So anyway, that's a, a, again, a long way of saying uh, you need to incentivize it. You need to reward it. You need to recognize it. You need to acclaim it, whatever. It needs to be elevated that this is important work to be done and we think it's important. That's great, Junius, and I very much appreciate that. I think also part of the question is whether you have um, certain training groups or uh, professional resources that are that you look to, in addition to your own expertise, point people to for building equity capacity um, amongst individuals. So, for example, um, I know folks have engaged with the People's Institute or the Racial Equity Institute. I know you sometimes talk about GARE. You, can you speak to a few of those that you think highly of? Well, those are good. Uh, GARE that you mentioned, if you're not familiar with that and you're affiliated with a governmental uh, agency, you might want to explore that. It's a government alliance on race and equity, and they focus specifically on helping governmental agencies, organizations, jurisdiction organize themselves to do equity work within government and would highly uh, recommend uh, them. In terms of, of, of groups, uh, transforming white privilege and uh, the, I'm blanking on the name, that, that's a subpart of Maggie uh, Potopchek's group. Sorry about that. I'm having a senior moment here. I can't remember the uh, the basic group. But transforming white privilege has a lot of resources for people. I don't know if they they have groups. I do think they do some uh, training. Uh, that's one that I need to follow up with, Jen, to just see who is actually forming support groups because I don't know. Um, I'm too old at this point for support, so I haven't been particularly conscious. I'm only kidding. Uh, I probably need support more than most folk, uh, given my personality and behavior. But anyway, those uh, group, there are a couple things, and I'll, I'll send them. J just during the, the uh, demonstrations after um, the George Floyd uh, murder, someone circulated and has posted uh, a really interesting tool, or it's called scaffolding for people's personal journey around race and equity. And there are two or three of those uh, resources. And some of those, as I recall, identified uh, support groups and th those mechanisms. I'll send that uh, so that uh, Tracy can post uh, 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 that. So those are, are a couple. But again, I'm at a loss in terms of who's kind of acting helping people form uh, and organize uh, support groups. No, those are all great references, Junius, and we can include some more in the post-show um, links as well, some coming in in the chat. Um, let's see. So we have a question here, uh, sort of shifting gears a little bit, working with funders. And I, in addition to asking this of Junius, I will invite any funders who are on the line to share your perspectives in the chat too. Um, how can we bring our donors and funders along in understanding that systems change work takes time and that traditional impact metric reporting will not be available in the same capacity, not, you know, sometimes more qualitative in nature, longer term, et cetera. Uh, what do you think about that question, Junius? Um, no, I think it, it is an important one uh, because you're right, it's long term. And one of the worst things that could happen is uh, retreating uh, funder investment in the thick of the work. And especially because we're dealing with a framework that requires an investment in the infrastructure in the form of the backbone to make sure that the collaborative can operate effectively in terms of, of moving the uh, agenda. So I, I think part of what I recommend to people, it goes back to what the evaluators uh, have already told us about leading and lagging indicators. And that lagging indicators is just what the questioner 
uh, uh, presented is that population level outcome as a result of systemic policy structural change ain't likely to happen tomorrow. And the, the tick on the needle because we're dealing with population level takes a lot of cases changing the situation to move the needle. So the idea of, yeah, those are the lagging indicators the big ticket down the road outcomes, but what are the leading indicators? The things that are likely to, um, to reflect change early on, and those are likely to be tied to things like our program performance measures, uh, but it's also tied to what is the work you're doing and making sure that you're elaborating a set of metrics around that equity work that you're doing, that you're in agreement with the funder, that these are the things that we're developing this scaffolding. Here are the metrics and measurements and the time frame for us getting this uh, um, get this infrastructure or scaffolding erected, so that you're all on the same page. That yes, it's long term. Those are the lagging. Here are the leading things, and here's what we're doing on equity. I also get back to the 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 other issue that I think is important uh, to highlight is the fact that we can sometimes get too sterile in our analysis of disparities and not think about the underlying fact that those are people. Uh, and that that one data point may be a thousand families who's being, who are being adversely impacted. What is critical is that we think about also, are there some things that we are doing or should be doing that we want to measure around relieving the immediate harm? And that that's an important foundational action and that we want to do that. Now, in collective impact, some people frame those around quick wins. That's one way. The other way to frame it is there's some stuff that we got to be doing right now for these kids or these families or whoever is impacted, else we exacerbate their conditions. We make it harder to provide them the support to get out of it when we ignore it for a long time. So in addition to your equity work, are there some of the shorter term things that you can say, yeah, we're gonna go in like right now and um, get kids computers <laughs> yeah, because they're uh, in virtual learning and half of the kids have trashy uh, technology that doesn't uh, permit them to fully participate so that build out what those things are and your strategy suite to be able to say, yeah, we're still going to get there, but here's what you should look at for our equity. And oh, by the way, we're trying to relieve some of the harm that's caused by this problem in the short term. And that's where we're, we're looking at some programmatic uh, type strategies and other things that will inform our systems change agenda, but will also provide some short-term relief because people are suffering. There's harm. There's suffering behind all of these problems uh, that we're trying to attack using collective impact. And Junius, on the topic of funders, I, I, uh, I will ask this question recognizing that it may be a really short or really long answer. Um, how do we deal with funders that aren't concerned about equity? <laughs> uh, and I only ask because I unfortunately know that y'all are encountering that in your work. Um, well, it's one of the reasons that you need to be careful in terms of not narrowing your focus on equity prematurely. And I say that because the broadest landscape for understanding equity, my focus is on race because I think it's the most pernicious problem that we face but it's not the only equity issue. So one of the things that I would suggest is not conceding that ground to them, but to look who is it that they care about, right? Who is it that their community is composed of and showing them that you should be, con yeah, this isn't racial equity, 
but we got a gender equity issue. Women make, you know, only two thirds of the income of men when similarly situated in terms of education and occupation. Aren't you concerned about that? You have no wives, sisters, mothers, daughters. It's trying to connect them to this universal concept of social equity and how it applies in their spheres of caring. And to make that connection to say, well, so you do care about equity. Where else besides your point of caring around equity are there disparities that as a foundation that is committed to the charitable interest of this community, shouldn't you look at all of those things? That's how I would attempt to do it. I would also get pissed that people who have money also buy the right to be stupid. Yeah, equity, some form of equity issues are present in every community in America, right? So it's a universal that we have tended to behave in ways that discriminate against people and therefore produce disparate outcomes. It's up to you to find what it is. And it would be a little concerning to me, and I can say this externally, that a foundation is so stupid with all the resources that they typically have not to figure out what the equity issue is in their community. Sorry for that, but I'm very impatient at this point in my career that people who don't think uh, equity is uh, an issue anywhere in their lives. They just haven't discovered it or have chose to ignore it. And it's likely the latter. Thank you, Junius. Lots of agreement in the chat and appreciation for that. Um, I don't think we have time for any more questions. Is there anything that you would like to share in closing, Junius, before I do a couple announcements? Just to say to folks, uh, I appreciate your interest in this and your attempt to deal with it. I know how hard it uh, is. I know how frustrating it is. Uh, I'm approaching 50 years <laughs> of dealing with race uh, equity uh, issues. And so I know, but it's worth it. It is worth it because this will help us when we get equity right, there are so many other things that we can get right. That cure to cancer is probably in those brown boys and girls that we ain't doing right by. Our next source of, of renewable energy is probably with that black boy over there that some of his peers are excluding because he's a brainiac. It's all over and we can't afford to lose it. So. This is really about all of us and correcting the past and setting us on a course where we can realize uh, the dream about having a multiracial, multi-ethnic, inclusive, democratic society that we're prospering in together. Thanks so much for attending today. Thank you, Junius. I get chills at least three times every time we do these sessions with your <laughs> listening to your passion and your insight. So thank you. And I know everyone on the line is sharing similar reflections in the chat. So I want to be sure you have a second to take a glance at that. So thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, I wanted to just share that if you are interested in more conversations with the Collective Impact Forum, uh, next week I'll be joined by Paul Schmitz. Some of you may have been on with him last week. Uh, one of our other senior advisors talking about managing across difference and difficult conversations that uh, folks encounter in your collaborative work. So that is um, a week from now. And then in addition to that, we have our upcoming Champions for Change um, workshop. That is our annual fall event. This year, we're spreading it over three weeks to make it a little bit easier to plug in amongst all of your other commitments. We'll be meeting every Tuesday for more of the formal training sessions. And then during conference weeks, we also will hold two office hours. Junius will be hosting one. Paul will be hosting one. And some of our other friends, including our friend Deb Halliday on the line, will be participating. So really looking forward to that. And we'd encourage you to check out Champions for Change. And then finally, we also want to be sure folks know about the podcast that we have. So this um, is available for, available for streaming on all of your favorite podcast platforms. So again, thank you, Junius. Thank you, Tracy, for making everything happen here behind the scenes. Very grateful and um, really always enjoy being in space with everyone on the line. Have, have a good, safe, and healthy day. <laughs>